Welcome back uh, to SA Today. Let's discuss uh, legal matters now and to get you into this. The trial for the multi-million rand asbestos roof removal case has been set for 15 April to 23 June 2024. 17 of the 18 accused appeared before the High Court in Bloemfontein. The accused include a former ANC Secretary General Ace Mahashule, businessman Edward Sodi, and a former Free State Human Settlement MEC Oli Mlameli. The state intends to revive the extradition application in in relation to U.S.-based accused Moradi Cholota, who is the former personal assistant to Mahashule during his tenure as Premier of the Free State. However, the NPA says the trial will still continue. Masumula Matlakala, who is accused number two, told the court that he has no legal representation and is financially burdened. Now, let's get into this analysis and other legal matters. We're now joined via Zoom by legal expert Alton Hart. Alton, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. In fact, let's start with this case. Ace Mahashule and some of his co-accused allege that their right to a fair trial has been infringed. Mahashule later labelled the court case uh, outside uh, to journalists as a political trial. What can we make of this case? Obviously, if one looks at uh, the Constitution and the Criminal Procedure Act guarantees a person the right to a speedy trial. And Mr. Mahashula, as we know now, his case has been on the road for roughly two years now, mm. and the trial has not commenced. I know there's a lot of um, administrative stuff that needs to kick in, but for me, normally when the state actually enrolls a matter, they must know or less, more or less that they are close to actually executing their mandate is actually to get the matter running. So for him, he can say that this is a political warfare against him so that they keep him out of the political arena because as the ANC's policy says, if, they, if you are accused of a crime, you cannot run for office. And I think that is what his argument is. But for me also now this trial, and now I see it set down for April 2024, which is very far, but there is certain things that needs to happen that we know that the matter is trial ready but the state has been saying from the get-go that they are trial ready Marashula has been saying that it's trial ready but yet the trial is not proceeding so for for, for me there i see that there is some unnecessary delays which could have been avoided if the state was a little bit more diligent in actually making sure that the extradition happened or whatever people they still want to charge or if they have to separate the trials from the other and when that person is here in south africa they can try them and talk about just separating the trials. How likely is uh, accused number two going to be ready when the trial resumes in April of next year? I mean, he's saying that basically he has no legal representation and he also doesn't qualify, of course, for free legal aid. Are we likely then to see more delays as this is concerned? No, that, that definitely because section 73 plus the constitution say that a person has the right to legal representation but also the court needs to look at this way he claims that he, he can't afford legal services then they need to do um, analysis to see uh, maybe to get legal aid on board to say listen yeah please check and give us an extensive reason as to why you say that this person does not qualify uh, for the services that is rendered by legal aid south africa and then take it from there because obviously if the person has some sort of assets that he can actually make liquid and dispose of that is not like sort of maybe a house that is not necessarily his primary home to actually um, pay his legal fees then that should be the option but i foresee if he doesn't have a legal representative the court will reprimand him most probably but the court cannot force him to proceed if he doesn't have legal representation I'd like us to get through a, a number of legal matters that are before the courts. Let's get into the Senzo Meiwa case now. I mean, where many South Africans are actually saying, you know, will we ever see justice done in this case? But let's start with the potential cloud that hangs over this case, and that is with the presiding judge, Chifua Maumela. And of course, the serious complaints that we're hearing labeled against him relating to his failure to deliver numerous judgments on time. How likely is this going to affect this case? Now, obviously, this is one of those things that um, no, uh, back uh, so maybe a couple of years ago, there was also a directive by the Chief Justice's office to say that magistrates need to bring judgments out in nine months. Uh, judges need to bring out judgments in at least 18 months from when the matter has been finalized or the evidence has been heard. So if there is these types of uh, complaints against Judge Maumela, then obviously he has to face the music coming from the JSC. And if it comes to a point where they make a recommendation to President Ramaphosa and he decides to say, listen, yeah, I'm going to now suspend Judge Maumela. 
for my reasons and the reasons advanced by the JSC, but also taking cognizance of what must Judge Maubela's reasons is for the delay in these judgments and balancing those two and say, okay, I'm going to suspend you. Then it means we need to get a new judge appointed to the Senzo Mayuatra, which means evidence will have to be led, led from the front again. The case has to start de novo because the judge normally when they sit in court, they look at the demeanor of witnesses to see if the witness is credible or not. So for the other judge, he cannot climb into Maube, uh, Judge Maubela's head now to say this is what he thought when this witness was testifying. So this will then delay the case further. And I would just call it a travesty of just, justice. Mm. Uh, others will call it uh, justice delayed as justice denied. Uh, then, of course, let's get into the trial itself. You know, the second witness uh, on the stand who was also uh, a, a witness um, at the time of uh, Meiwa's death. He was in the house. How will then the state, you know, treat just some of the discrepancies that we are hearing already uh, in terms of the evidence that are coming out between the, the state's own witnesses? No, obviously, already you can look at Tumelo Madlala and Mtokozisi uh, Tuala. They are already contradicting each other. Yeah. Um, because there is a statement where the statement makes mention of, he said, uh, Longa Tuala came into the house and he dropped the gun. And now suddenly it's the intruders that came with the gun. So there's a lot of contradictions. And what the state advocate below is trying to do is to sort of half remedy these inconsistencies that is actually going to be tackled on cross-examination. The only other thing is if he's of the view that this witness is not telling the truth, he can rather use the process in the Criminal Procedure Act to declare this witness hostile and then deal with him in such a way and not to try and sort of have cross-examining this witness to say, but this, you've said this in your statement and that. That is going to come from the defense attorneys, and that's what the objections was about when the defense attorneys raised it in court. But I already see that there is so many discrepancies that the witnesses that was actually on the scene when the former Bafanya Bafana captain died is already contradicting each other. And when there is doubt, the magistrate must acquit these guys. And if these guys are acquitted and they somehow charge the people in the second docket, they might say, but there you had the five people that actually killed him. You didn't. And they get acquitted and we'll never know what happened to Senzo Mayua in that house. Mm, that is unfortunate. Lastly, um, Elton, I'd like to get your take on what has been described as a, a shocking verdict. Of course, the Pretoria High Court has ruled that all hospitals in the country, all clinics, schools, as well as police stations be exempt from what we are all suffering from. And that, of course, is load shedding. Just your take on that. No, I think that is for me, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good court order, but it will have no bite. Because if ESCOM disobeys the court order, what can you do? Are you going to say, I'm going to shut down Madupi because you did not um, give us electricity? And I think also that has a lot of practical implications for it. Because how do you know the schools, the police stations, they sit on different grids. How is it possible? Because then it will mean that certain people will never get load shedding in that area. And then it will just have a negative effect on the grid. In any event, the, the very thing that load shedding is trying to sort of have ease up is going to then be increased unless we say we're going to build completely new power stations, which is not going to happen. We don't have that money. So the court order, I think it's like what we say, a court order without bite. It, it, it cannot be uh, enforced because you cannot. What are you going to do to ESCOM if they don't give electricity? Take the machines, take what? Then they, you cripple them further. So for me, I think um, this is something that will still be appealed, but I don't think that court order is something that we should uh, be uh, sort of half looking towards to say this is the guide stick or the yardstick to work with because it's empty for me. It's, mm -hmm. it's an empty court order. All right, Elton, thank you so much for your time um, and, of course, your analysis on a number of issues that we are following here from a legal perspective. Legal expert there, Elton Hartley.